Hello everybody. Sometimes I find it almost unbelievable that in spite of the incredible and often exotic machinery I've got to drive over the last seven years, there is still a whole bunch of relatively ordinary stuff out there I've yet to get my hands on. And what I'm driving today has to be one of my most requested reviews ever. This is the Volvo C30. Honestly, sat here now, I'm struggling to think of why I haven't driven this car sooner. After all, it looks good, it sounds good, it has an interesting engine, and I was having an absolute whale of a time until somebody pointed out this is the car from Twilight. Now, I don't really know much about Twilight. In fact, all I know for certain is that you had to choose whether you were Team Fred or Jason. And I think Fred was a crip and Jason was a blood. Handily though, I do know a little bit more about cars. And so today we're talking the Volvo C30. I think the first thing that I have to say about the C30, and perhaps this is one of the reasons it has endured so well, is the fact that even now, nearly 18 years after its launch, it still looks fantastic. This model I'm driving is a 2006, so it's not even a facelift, and still, to my eyes, this is not just a decent car, it's a great looking car as is that Audi Quattro that's just gone past. You see, good design may date, but it doesn't really age. And this is a corker. It also seems to be one of those cars that I think helped popularise Volvo in the minds of not just petrol heads, but young people. Let's be honest here, for a very long time you mentioned Volvo, and all anyone could think of would be pipe, slippers, flat cap and antique furniture. They were well loved for their load lugging ability and their incredible safety. and that was it. But at some point in the last 10 or 15 years, they've become trendy. In many ways, I think they've seen a transformation of fortune akin to that of the BMW motorcycle. Even as late as the 1990s, they were desperately uncool. Then a couple of guys tried to drive them around the world, and all of a sudden, the BMW GS is one of the most popular bikes on the planet. And two decades on, nothing much has changed. I can't quite say for certain that there was the same transformational moment for Volvo. Perhaps Twilight had a little bit to do with it. But in the seven and a half minutes that I've been driving and recording this video, I've already passed two of these. And that says a lot. So then, what exactly is the C30? I'm sure plenty of people will be keen to tell you it's simply a second generation Ford Focus in a slightly fruity frock. However, that's oversimplifying things. Yes, it was based on the Volvo P1 platform, built during a time when the company was a member of Ford's premier automotive group. What this means is that it does share a number of significant components with the likes of the second generation Focus, from the suspension to the steering, braking componentry, and some electronics too. However, the floor pan is bespoke, and there are a number of other touches designed to make sure you're never going to mistake this for anything from the blue oval. And humorously, I have just looked down here and realised this has the same window switch as my Aston Martin DB9. Also a great number of Jaguars. In 2008 and 9, the car underwent a few changes with the spec and equipment list altering a little bit before then in 2010 it finally being facelifted, with production ending in 2013. The car was actually based on the earlier Volvo SCC concept car. This debuted in 2001. And though from the front they do look fairly different, at the rear they are shockingly similar, both featuring a sort of P1800 inspired frameless glass hatch, which looks very cool. Though I have to also point out that actually is one of my first negative points against the C30. You'd think it'd be very practical, being a Volvo, 
However, it is not. First off, it being a three-door means accessing the relatively limited room in the back is a little tricky, though not impossible. But the bigger gripe I have is the fact that in order to cover your stuff from prying eyes, Volvo have fitted a sort of needlessly complex little parcel shelf, which when it's fitted leaves you with a sort of postbox-like aperture to get all your stuff through. That's frustrating. The boot itself is not exactly tiny, but neither is it particularly generous. And so those who are fond of buying furniture at the weekends to go with their meatballs should probably look elsewhere. I have absolutely no idea which of the many trim levels this is, but sat here, it's not exactly overflowing with luxury. These seats are fabric and quite comfortable in the way that many Volvo seats are, but are also manually adjusted. This stuff here is, um, well, it's horrid. The steering wheel itself is nice, though um, comically large in the hand. The buttons on it do feel a little bit cheap, but at least there is cruise control. The stalks themselves are pretty much okay, and this centre console here gives you just about everything you need, including an adorable little dial pad for the phone connection that I'm sure packed up a long, long time ago. I'm sure you've likely guessed, but the display attached to the top of the screen, which gives you Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, is not standard. Instead, apparently, coming from Amazon. You do, though, have two-zone climate control and heated seats up in the front, which is something, and there's a reasonable amount of space, too. I'm 5'10", but with a long body, and this is just about OK. But though good looks, a semi-desirable badge, and a starring role in a teen fantasy drama from about 15 years ago, I'm sure has helped the image of the C30. As far as petrol heads are concerned, there's only one reason I think anyone buys these, and that is under the bonnet. Because though you could get this car with a nice selection of four-cylinder petrols and diesels, there were also a few fives available, and that is what this car has today. But it is not the T5, which is likely the engine you are thinking of. That is the one that I'm sure everybody is keen to tell you is a very close relative of the unit found in the Ford Focus ST and RS of the time, making here 220 and then 230 horsepower. Instead, what we have here is the incredibly rare, and honestly, I didn't realize they'd even done it, naturally aspirated 2.4 litre five cylinder. It makes 170 horsepower, 170 pound foot of torque, that's 230 newton meters, and I think means this car could be an ideal candidate for my cool cars for young people playlist. Because you see, the T5 has almost certainly gained a reputation with insurance companies for being the sort of thing bought by people explicitly because of that engine and the fact that it's got a turbo attached, meaning you can get quite a bit more power out of it than it left the factory with. This, though, still makes a nice noise, has a reasonable amount of performance, but shouldn't have the same stigma attached. Before I draw my conclusion, though, I suppose it is only right that I do give the car a thorough spanking, which I have been told I must certainly do on account of its very kind owner, Doug, who's actually left it with me for the entire weekend. He, meanwhile, has been enjoying the company of the DB9, and seems to think he's got the better half of this bargain, though no doubt a few people, I'm sure, will disagree. He has his own YouTube channel called Nightfall Drives, and I've previously driven on a couple of occasions his beautiful Nightfall Blue Lotus Evora S. So if you want to check out any videos on that, this, or my Aston Martin DB9, go check the channel out. I'm sure he'd appreciate it. I've just got out of a 580 horsepower electric Kia, so this is something of a culture shock. Gonna have to use the gearbox, make this engine work. Sing for your supper, Volvo! There is really something quite alluring about this Volvo. It's honestly not what I expected, although that might partly be because I'm not sure what it was that I was expecting. In any case, the engine is lovely. 170 horsepower dragging with driver, likely the best part of one and a half tons, means that performance is decent, if not stellar, but that's fine. It means you can rev it out. And this gearbox, a five speed here, a six in the T5, is actually really quite nice. 
although on the motorway you'll still be revving at close to 3000 rpm so I expect that might get a little tiring. Grip is fairly decent even in these slightly chilly and greasy conditions. Drive goes as you might imagine exclusively to the front wheels. I don't believe there's a limited slip differential or anything fancy like that. Currently the car is entirely standard, exhaust included. Doug does have plans to do a resonator delete just to unlock a little bit more of that five cylinder warble but having done the drive-bys with it yesterday when it's under load you can just about hear the fact it's something a little bit different both outside and in. I've never actually been a big fan of the five cylinder noise and I know that makes me a little bit of a weirdo but it's grown on me and today it certainly marks the car out as being something just a little bit different. Rev matching is fairly easy as is heel and toe. <laughs> it is a really enjoyable thing to hustle. I honestly thought the suspension was going to be a lot more compliant than it is. It's not crashy but it is quite firm. Turning is lovely though, very positive, the car's very keen and the visibility is excellent. A pillar is on the thin side, B pillars so far back it really doesn't matter and straight out the back you can see plenty too on account of that nice glass rear hatch. Let's see what the turning circle's like. That often is a weakness in cars like this. Oh actually it's pretty good, better than the Kia that's for sure. Let's let these bikers pass shall we? You're welcome. You're welcome. Proper bikers say thank you. Here we go. There's a slight delay in the throttle response. Not enough to really be an issue, but it is there and worth mentioning. The clutch is nice and light, as is, to be honest, the brake and the throttle. The weighting of the steering is actually a little heavier again than you would think, but I like that a lot. What I'm not so keen on is the fact this car does seem to have a vibration of some description in it. I'm trying to work out whether it's just under power or all the time, but I'm fairly convinced something is not entirely right with this. And that might be why Doug was able to pick it up for such a bargain. He paid for this car, are you ready, just £2,300. And that's remarkable for a couple of reasons. First off, that's less than a pound per cc, and I think, as metrics go, that's a pretty good barometer of whether a car is good value or not. Secondly, these are just rare, I mean, full stop. This morning I did a search and there were only nine five-cylinder C30s for sale, of which the vast majority were the diesel, the D5, and two were the petrol T5. There wasn't a single naturally aspirated 2.4i out there. And while I was doing this research, I was reminded of why it was I've never actually thought about buying one of these. That's because the T5 in particular appears to have acquired cult status. And if you want to pick up one of those today, you're going to need to part with at least £7,000. That is for a car that when new probably cost about triple that, but at its absolute youngest is going to be 10 years old now. That's madness. I mean, for that sort of money, you could get yourself into a proper, well, BMW, Audi, Mercedes, including a selection of M cars or AMGs, maybe not quite RS products, but I suppose there'd be a few RS3s in there. You could also then get into a Golf R32 for not dissimilar money, and there's a whole bunch of other cool stuff out there that's, well, not a Volvo. I have also over the years been put off by the relative impracticality of it, though I will admit that today I think I am as equally drawn to it on account of its rather beguiling looks. What's even more fascinating is that Doug brought this to me initially as part of my Winter Banger series, but honestly, it's far, far too good for that, and so it's already been promoted to at least cool cars for young people. The only thing I think that would really get in your way is the combined cost of insurance and fuel. This currently has been averaging 27.4 mpg. And that likely is another reason why I've never bought one, because you could get yourself an equally large, if not larger, BMW with six cylinders, and it'd probably drink less. Still, if you don't do the miles, that's likely to be less of a concern, and in its favour, it is at least U-less compliant, which the diesel of the day will not be. 
Previously, Doug's garage consisted of his Evora, alongside which he had an NC generation Mazda MX-5 with the BBR200 upgrade, a brilliant thing, and he decided that the Lotus really wasn't the sort of car for winter, neither was the MX-5. So he decided to find something that he and his partner could drive through the cold, sleety, snowy, miserable months without feeling too bad about it. And when they saw this, they said, hmm, you know what, actually, that's a properly interesting car with a slightly different engine. Why not? And I've got to say, their logic is impeccable. OK, the stereo is terrible, but the little Amazon aftermarket edition has at least given this car a little bit more day-to-day -day usability, and overall it's actually a very, very pleasant thing to drive about. The incoming exhaust mod should hopefully also unleash a little bit of that lovely five-cylinder warble without making it intolerable on long journeys, and I've got to say, it is still a darn good-looking thing. I honestly wouldn't actually be fussed about having the T5 because I just don't really need or want the extra performance. I'm sure once you have one of those, particularly if you tinker with it, you'll run into the limitations of the front wheel drive platform. This though feels just about right. I would however want a nicer interior, preferably with a bit of leather and the Dynaudio stereo that I think you could get, which tended to be one of the better systems out there. Issues? Well, yes, I'm sure they have quite a few. However, as I'm not particularly au fait with the model, I think the best thing to do at this point is to invite all those who are still watching to pop into the comment section and let me know what it is that you know about the Volvo C30. Anything that you should keep an eye out for? Common hints, tips, big deal-breaking issues? Let me know. Are they rusting? Are they not? Are they fine? Please tell me. Is this the engine to buy? Is there one to avoid? I'd love to know. For somebody on the hunt for their first sporty car, I think this would be just about perfect. Even if you're being a bit of a thug in the corners, when it's dry, grip is actually pretty good. And that engine has a lot more bark than bite. It sounds fantastic and up to about the national speed limit, it's reasonably brisk, but if you try and go beyond that, you'll find actually you've more or less reached the limits of its performance. And if you are upgrading from, say, a one to one and a half litre turbo, the engine hopefully has just about enough character to make up for its potential deficit in terms of low down torque. And so with that, I think really I've probably said most of the things that I'd like to about the Volvo C30. It's been a long time coming, I know, but actually, it's turned out to be a fairly pleasant surprise. So, I want to say a big thank you to Doug, and a reminder again, check out his channel, Nightfall Drives, and of course, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below if you haven't already, and hit that subscribe button. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.